Good afternoon, people. Today I'm going to talk to you about a dragon. Every continent of the world has stories of dragons. Wherever these mythical beasts lived, these ancient legends endowed dragons with great power, life-changing power. In some cultures, they are creative and protective, and in others, all-consuming and destructive. They reflect the fears and the aspirations of the storytellers and the times they lived in. The dragon I speak about is a metaphor that represents the joint response of the people doing the work to the leader's influence on their behavior. Every organization has a dragon. Every organization can use lean thinking to harness it. Like dragons, the people doing the work have the power to create or destroy. They too reflect the fears and the aspirations of their storytellers. My dragon is called Ingami Toyota, and there it is on the screen. In 2013, lean thinking came into my life, and with it, I could write about a dragon in my care. This dragon lived in a remote part of Africa, wedged between the Kalahari Desert and the Okavango Delta. A Toyota dealership operating in a challenging environment, plagued with a lack of skills, constant power failures, water shortages, distance from suppliers, high ambient temperatures, and challenging road conditions. The Global Competitiveness Report for 2013-14 showed Botswana's poor work ethic as the most problematic factor for doing business in the country. Lean thinking overcame all these challenges and provided us with improvements that were beyond anything we could have imagined. I'm putting these up because I want to show the measurement of change, not because of the finances, just so you can see how it changed over a period of two years. And it reflected in money. But for me, the ch biggest change was with engagement. I had the joy of engagement with the people I worked with. It changed everything because their self-worth improved and they were able to grow as people and they were able to find the joy of problem solving and the joy of having control over the problem solving. And this changed everything for everybody, especially me. We started learning about lean from Dave Brunt with Terry O'Donoghue, the COO of Halfway at that time. It started with him, them coming for a week doing training with us and there was, out of our 98 staff, 25 of us went on the training and it varied from the, the higher echelons in the business to the guy that was running the wash bay of the cars. Everybody got a chance. Noting that the person um, running the wash bay was basically illiterate. So we did all our training together. And it was during this time that we learned about the Toyota house, or the lean house. And we were introduced to the halfway house, which was the new company that had purchased us. And at the top of their house was mobility. This was what we had to do. We had to give our customer mobility as soon as we possibly could in time and correct. From the start, I knew that getting our people to change would be hard, very hard. And our team started with the challenge of fear. They were afraid of the change. They were afraid of having new ownership. 
So when people become afraid, they challenge, and it came to a point of passive resistance and at times militancy within the technical team. Many people have asked me, how did I eventually get them to change? In a nutshell, I did not change my employees. I changed myself because I'm the only person I can have control over, really. I changed how I responded to the problems and to their fears. And then they changed. And I only changed when I learned to reflect on my responses and control my responses. And I changed because I had to. There wasn't really a choice but to change. Otherwise, we would not have been able to achieve anything. Lean gave me a guideline on how to achieve this. And lean thinking carried us through until we could accomplish what we did. As we were having so many difficulties with the passive aggression and the militancy, I recognized that our human resources was our first place to focus. So with my HR person next to me, who had also been on the training, we brought, I brought in every staff member by themselves into my office and we addressed their fears. What were they afraid of? Then I told them about what we had to do. I addressed why we had to change, where we had to change, how we were going to make the changes, and most importantly, why we had to change. Recognizing that this was a small town and these were people that had families to support. They couldn't afford to lose good, stable jobs, but they had to come along with me on the journey. And the best way was to address their fears and let them express what they were frightened of. And you would be amazed at how easy it was to remove some of those fears. They were small fears, little things around their life. But I made it very clear that change would still have to happen, and the whys. It was to keep their jobs, to keep them looking after their families, for having a better day at work, because these systems could help them. It was the first step towards getting them on board. Then, we worked very hard at making the work visible, using all the lean techniques we possibly can and designing some of our own. By making the work visible, we created visuals that you could stand, up, uh, stand next to and talk about, but also we started to introduce single lane flow so we could see the problems and address the problems with the people doing the work. Here we have a little visual of a wash bay for our wash bay guy who was illiterate. So documents that he had to fill in were not the greatest idea. It was also a, a place that was external, in, in the, almost in the sun, so we, we could get vehicles dry. It was an open area, and we have lots of dust and wind. So by creating this kind of visual, we could see if we were ahead or behind. And also, it wasn't difficult. They didn't have to write anything. All they needed to do was move up the, the timeline and make sure that the cars were in the right positions on the other side of the timeline. So you can see here on the timeline, they can see that they've got a pile up of work in the little picture. And this allowed them, they didn't have to read anything. They could see, and they could control it um, became our most powerful visual because I started to use it to see how well the workshop was doing because output is important. In our parts department, we are our biggest customer, 80% of our business came from government. 
And those are big orders, complex orders, and um, getting paid for them required a long process. Even getting them fitted required a long process. So we, had, we created a, a system for controlling orders in, orders complete, where they were stored, how many days using a tally they'd been in there. If you see, there's a top one there with a, a very long tally. This was a government vehicle that had been in an accident, so they couldn't bring it in. And we had to push and push and push to try and get them to bring it in. So we could see and have the conversation at the board every day on the status of, of every single part that was coming in on special orders for customers. Here, here we have our work in progress. We had a, a very large board with magnetic chips with the details of each vehicle and its status. And we had a meeting every day at that board where we could talk about the work and move the chips and hand over responsibility within the departments from waiting to quote to a comeback job and then back into the workshop to where it was being worked for, worked on. So it created one more time a place where we could stand and talk about the work with the people doing the work. And that was something was a daily huddle every single day to make sure we were on top of it. The visuals also made the daily gamer walks productive because we could see what was pre previously unseeable. A little bit like dressing the invisible man. We could start to see the shape of the business by walking and seeing the visuals. Something we couldn't see before walking through, we could start to see as we walked the Gemba. It made the Gemba talk to us. The Gemba had a voice. And as we did that, we started to observe the work more because we could see. And we could learn about the wastes. Seeing the burden it puts on the people doing the work. And once one starts to see that burden, one can respond by making the work easier and simpler and more controllable for the person doing it. Nobody ever argues about that. When we can make something easier, people want it to be easier. When we observe the work, we could document and grasp the current situation and do a gap analysis, giving us the problem to solve. And we did this with very frontline people in very, very simple A3 formats so that they could start to understand the gap. We learned to reframe a problem into a gap. It was a very good day when a employee came to me the first time and said, I have got a gap. He didn't say he got a problem. He said, I have got a gap. And it was a moment of change that came across everybody because he started to do it and then the guy he was working with started to do it. Then they talked to somebody else and they realized they had a gap. Nobody shouted at them. Nobody said, you're doing a bad job. So we could see and reveal all the problems they had doing the work. Now we could do a gap. We could start to use the A3 report and find countermeasures and follow them through doing the PDCA. And for some problems on the front lines, it was very simple A3 and very simple PDCAs. And then other times, it, were, it required more teamwork, more effort, but by doing it with the team, everybody learned how. And everyone learned to not be afraid and to celebrate the problem. And at the same time, they learned to celebrate the failure because it was an opportunity to learn and to grow.
So when we had problems to solve, we improved the work. And then we started with Kaizen. And it was Kaizen that grew the people, that built their self-esteem, because they solved problems, they found solutions, they were cheered when they managed to find some radical little improvement with the work and make it better for everybody. Because now they were given the opportunity to grow. And that is what people want at work. They want to be able to grow. And we've created an environment of growth. They want to know their managers care about them. They want to know their managers want them to grow. That's research that's been done. It was done by a South African HR team. They went all over the world and they collected information. And the predominant answer is, what do you want from your boss? I want my boss to care about me and I want him to let me grow. We should be doing it because the results blew me away. And Lean helped me to get people to grow because that's part of what Lean is. It's developing the people to do the work. When we were doing the Kaizen, we had many challenges to overcome. And we had our staff making the improvements. And here we have what was the Orange Bay, two-stage Orange Bay. And it was to make the unpredictable work predictable. And one vehicle went through every 10 minutes. But the problem with that is they had to take wheels off. And taking wheels off at this height, and putting them on the ground, working on the brake system and then lifting it up, would have just been too much stress on the body. So I said to them, guys, I need you to make a plan. How are we going to do this? We need something that's going to cradle that tire. So the team of technicians got together with the workshop manager and they designed it. And no, it's not beautiful. And there's a reason it's not beautiful. Because if I, I started telling them, don't paint things. Because when you paint things, you think they're finished. Leave it that way and use it and see where you need to fix it. And it allowed us to put the vehicles through it was only when we had that particular tool we could even attempt to do that kind of work where we're putting vehicles through every 10 minutes because it allowed the technician to take the tyre off and just put it down on the stand and then just lift it up to put it on. It was a simple tool designed by the people doing the work. On our receiving we had to receive batches of vehicles because that's the way government worked. In the mornings, the vehicles would be batched and sent to us. And it took 20 minutes to do a vehicle for a service advisor. So we put it into single lane flow and we were getting a four minute tack time on it. So every four minutes, a vehicle's coming out done, allowing us to stream them into, into the workshop to start being worked on. This was done by the staff doing the work. We, we set it up. We started the flows. We had some problems. I got a hold of Dave, got a hold of Terry, and I said, I'm having some issues. They said, try this, try that. And basically, it was the team themselves that did it. And it made a big difference, once again, to their self-esteem. They'd be working together on it. They understood the problem. And they were part of the solution. They understood it from beginning to end. And noting that a lot of these staff, although literate, 
hadn't, didn't have high comprehension le levels. You must understand in Botswana they do get an education, but the translation from Botswana into English is hard, mentally comprehending the, the gap. You know, there's a gap with it. And so it was quite a feat for them. But they'd got so joyful about doing all these changes and the difference it made to them in their lives that they just got stuck in and did it. So by this time, the virtuous circle of continuous improvement had become part of our lives. Terry always calls it the virtuous circle. Once it starts, it can only be good. If you look at our journey, it was really just a process. Big or small, it's the same process. If you're a massive business or you're a small business, you still have to run through these processes. But the one thing that we did do well, we were very unafraid of failing. I'm not saying we just charged into experiment and did silly stuff, but we tried, experimented together, we learned together, we failed together. We picked ourselves up when we failed, we brushed ourselves off when we said we will try again. And that's one of the reasons we managed to do so much Kaizen work, was we were happy to fail, get up, brush ourselves off, and not beat ourselves up. Just get on with it and change, make the changes. As my customer today, I want to give you value. The only value that I can give you comes from my own experience. Today, I offer you the keys of the four doors of transformation. If we hadn't, if I hadn't have opened these doors, we would have failed spectacularly. It would have been a crashing mess. And I've reflected on this a great deal before I wrote this document. The door of alignment. If the value statement at the top of our house is not authentic, it is impossible to gain alignment. If we do not gain alignment, it's difficult to build a culture. Alignment happens when people understand the value statement, proactively seek its usage when problem solving. When they do this, they feel supported by the leadership when providing this value to the customer. The key to the door is authentic statement that the leadership support and believe in consistently. It must be a 24-7 commitment, like a lighthouse on a dangerous sea. When we waver in this area, we cause confusion that spreads quickly everywhere. We have to believe if we want them to believe. We have to be consistent in our purpose, in our alignment. But we cannot align to something that is not true or real. We had mobility as at the top of our house. Every time people came to me with a problem, I asked them, are you giving the customer mobility? Because often the problem was about themselves and their issue. And then they would look again and they would say no, or yes. But mostly would they'd say no, and then they'd have to realign themselves and realign what they were, the, the problem, to the top of the house. When they came back to me, then they could explain their problem better. But if you're not true to what it says, or if it's created by a PR person, rather than the people involved in the work of where they need to go, you actually can't do an A3. Because A3, the question is, are we giving mobility? When you're looking at the answer, it has to correspond. It has to go up. It has to answer that question. The door of human resources. We have to ask these questions. Has our HR department been part of the lean training? Do they understand their role? Do they understand their position? 
are some of our organisation's HR practices incompatible with the development of problem solvers? How are new staff members introduced to lean, especially senior management level who have come from other companies that are not lean? Do they have mentors that are committed and strong enough to guide them? Do they know the boundaries they cannot cross? The key is to build a close relationship with human resources where they know and support the changes. This might require additional training. It might require policy changes. It might require that one looks carefully at assessments and how they are carried out and ask the question, how do we measure? Your understanding of this is important. HR cannot be a distant planet. Like yourself, HR can make or break the trust of the team. You need them by your side every step of the way. The door of presence. Being present as a leader is vital. You need to be seen at the gemba, at huddles, on front lines. And when I say present, I don't mean just giving, they're giving instructions. I mean having conversations, monitoring progress, engaging with the team. This presence will be about listening, meeting the problems raised with empathy, making sure that communication is productive, asking questions, not giving solutions, respecting the people, doing the work by meeting them where, where they are, not where you are. The door of reflection. After walking the gemba, we need to make time to reflect on what we see. It is vital to building our culture. If the front line is not reflecting the lean message, you will know there's a gap to close. Front lines are your hand mirror. That's why it's called reflection. If you are not seeing the customer value at this place for both the internal and the external customer, you have found a gap. All organisations have these doors. The size of the organisation does not change this. You have access to the keys within your sphere of influence. And this is where you start. You start with the people around you by developing them and helping them. And so you will spread the message of lean. Terry O'Donoghue, in my first days of lean, gave me a blank piece of paper and said, write on it what you want to achieve it's your story to write. It was quite a scary moment for me because I'd been used to being an employee who was controlled by the two shareholders that worked in the business. And all of a sudden, I was given this scary blank sheet of paper. So eventually, I wrote a book. So today, I want to pass this gift on to you. I give you a blank sheet of paper. The storytellers are you, the leaders. You guide the power of the dragon and what it can accomplish. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.